Okay, we're going to continue with multi-core cache management. Mm, let's see uh, how much we can cover. Uh, and then hopefully we're going to move on to heterogeneous multi-core. These are some exciting topics. Uh, so remember, we were over here, we were talking about efficient cache utilization. Before that, we actually covered, uh, well, we were going to talk about efficient cache utilization. But before we go to efficient cache utilization, I want to finish up the cache partitioning, uh, cache sharing debate, if you will. We've, we've seen multiple uh, examples. Utility-based cache partitioning was one example, which has influenced a lot of research afterwards. And then fair cache sharing and partitioning, that was another example. The goal was fairness over there. In utility-based cache partitioning, the goal was throughput, application-level throughput. And now we're going to look into controlled cache sharing. And all of those previous approaches started from a shared cache. So a shared cache was the start, and then the key question they asked was, how do you partition the cache? Uh, okay, these were the things that we looked at. We basically looked at hardware-based cache partitioning, software-based cache partitioning, now we're going to look uh, at a different approach. We're going to start with private caches. Let's assume that they're the basis. We're going to add sharing to private caches. And the idea is very simple. We're going to spill our extra load on some caches that are not using their extra, uh, extra capacity. That's the idea over here. Uh, basically, we would like to achieve the benefits of private caches. Uh, they have a lot of benefits, as we've discussed earlier. Low latency, design that's coupled with the core that they're private to, performance isolation, while sharing cache capacity across the course. So we don't want to get the downsides of private caches. And the idea is adaptive spill receive caching. This is one example of this. Other, uh, this is also sometimes called cooperative caching. You're basically cooperating across the cores in, your, uh, in how to use your caches. You start with a private cache design for performance isolation, low latency, but you dynamically steal space from other cores that do not need all of their private caches. It's a very simple idea. There are many ways of potentially building it. Uh, and some caches can spill their data to other cores caches dynamically. I'll give you one example of it very quickly. Uh, but there are other ways of potentially building it. Uh, so, okay, if you think, uh, think about private caches, uh, it looks like this, basically. You have these four different caches that are private. You get fast latency because you don't have cache banks in a shared cache. You, know, you essentially have this fast latency to your private cache. You have a tile design and performance isolation. We, we already talked about that. The problem is when one core needs more cache and some other core has spare cache, private cache-based systems cannot share the capacity if you are completely private. So we're, we're going to make it less private right now. So this is one example. It's actually one of the earlier incarnation of cooperative caching. This is also used in distributed systems. So a lot of the ideas that we're discussing are applicable to many levels of systems. In distributed systems, you have a node and you have another node. This node runs out of cache space, disk space, whatever you would like to consider, you can spill it to some other node uh, that's far away or that's reasonably close by. Uh, so as we discussed, multi-core systems are becoming more like on-chip distributed systems. So some people have proposed uh, this sort of uh, cache spilling. This is one algorithm for spilling. Basically, whenever this cache evicts uh, a block, it spills it to some other cache that's the neighbor, let's say. Uh, and you can choose an algorithm as to whom to evict to, because these caches may not be equidistant from each other, right? This cache may be connected to this cache, uh, but not to this cache directly. You have to go through this uh, core, through a router, uh, to get to this cache. So there are latency issues over here also, which we, which we briefly talked about but, uh, when we talked about threat scheduling, for example. We'll go into more detail when we talk about interconnects. So this, uh, this work basically proposes uh, that uh, algorithm, uh, which may or may not be good, right? Because whenever you're evicting something from this cache, maybe you don't want to put it anywhere because you're not going to reuse it. Ideally, you would like to understand uh, whether you're going to use this. And maybe you don't want to put it to any cache because this cache may be already oversubscribed by the core. So clearly, uh, and there's a spill probability that this work introduces. With, with some probability, uh, you actually evict it or, uh, and not, not put it anywhere else. Uh, or, uh, and with some other probability, 1 minus p, spill probability, you put it to your neighbor's cache. So that spill probability is a probabilistic approach, but may not be a good approach because you, know, you don't know whether that cache block may potentially be useful, right? You're just flipping a coin. Uh, and if none of the cache blocks are useful, your coin is essentially uh, causing you to put uh, useless cache blocks to somebody else's cache. 
And in this case, uh, this work uh, also shows that all caches uh, uh, spill as well as receive. This may not be a good idea because there, there can be some caches over here where the cores are utilizing the cache extremely well. They need more cache. There can be some other caches where the cores uh, that are connected to that cache are not utilizing the cache. They have spare cache. You don't want both of them to spill and receive at the same time. So that's the idea. Basically, this work, uh, well, the, the next work that I'm going to talk about, which I've already referenced, introduced a more robust, high-performance mechanism that provides capacity sharing. And the idea is very simple. Uh, again, this is one potential implementation. There could be more implementations. Uh, you designate each cache as a spiller or a receiver, but not both, because of the reason I said. Some caches may be oversubscribed, some caches may be underutilized. Uh, and you basically, uh, and this is the example, basically you have a bit, single bit saying whether the cache is spiller or receiver. And you spill uh, evicted cache blocks from one cache to one of the receivers. And evicted cache blocks from receiver caches are essentially discarded because they're not spilling, uh, they're receiving. Right. Again, you can tune these parameters. Uh, so for example, this can spill to different caches that are receivers, uh, and this cache uh, can spill uh, also, but the other caches cannot spill. And then the key question is, how do you decide which cache is a spiller or a receiver? Uh, this is also posed in this paper as, what is the best m-bit binary string that maximizes the performance of spill-receive architecture? And the m-bit binary string is this single bit uh, assigned for each cache. It's essentially a bit vector, right? How do you predict that bit vector? Okay, so basically this paper used the idea of set sampling that we discussed uh, earlier. It's called set dueling over here. Basically, you divide the cache into three portions. You can have each cache into three portions. You can have spiller sets, receiver sets, and follower sets. Basically, if you want to decide whether, whether this cache should be a spiller or receiver, you basically emulate spilling, receiving, and followers are following uh, the best policy. We've seen this before, right? You basically choose the best replacement policy. It's essentially a replacement policy, whether you spill or receive. And you basically hard code some of the sets, as you see, uh, and then uh, you basically figure out which ones lead the, leads to the lowest number of misses. So you already know this basic infrastructure, basic idea. Uh, whenever you want to select between two different policies, you dedicate some sets to those policies, and you pick which one is doing better based on some metric. In this paper, the metric is miscount which may not be a great metric, as you know, uh, because stall time is a more important, because misses can be overlapped, right? But that's okay. This is one implementation. Uh, take all of these with a grain of salt. I'm giving you the ideas. P particular implementations in these cases may or may not be the best implementations. And actually, some of these ideas went into uh, shared caches in large systems like IBM, uh, uh, Power8 or so. Okay. Uh, Basically, you decide, you monitor, you choose the best policy, and then you apply to the follower sets using the single counter over here. So how, do, how does this work when you have multiple caches? Basically, each cache has some sets that are dedicated to always spilling and always receiving. And uh, each cache has its own counter to decide whether it's a spiller or receiver. Different caches have different sets because you don't want uh, to sample uh, this set uh, and this set uh, to be the same uh, spiller, for example, in both caches, because if this cache decides to spill, and this is also spilling, that may not be good. You don't want interference in these spiller sets uh, across different caches. Basically, you, you basically try to figure out whether this cache should be a spiller by just looking at this set, but no other set in, in, in the other cache is a spiller or receiver, uh, if, if it's the same set. Okay, basically, you choose different spiller and receiver sets uh, from different caches, uh, as you can see in this picture. And each cache independently decide whether it should be a spiller or receiver, which is not that hard to do. Make sense? And it, to be able to do this, of course, the spiller uh, uh, lines over here spill to the receiver lines, as you know, uh, to, to these lines over here. OK, so this paper does some performance evaluation, and you can read the paper for that. And it shows that, basically, this is good in terms of performance. Uh, you've seen similar graphs before. This is, I think, in terms of weighted speed up. Uh, for different types of workloads, as you see over here. I don't remember the workloads. Basically, some, some workloads are givers because they have extra cash. Some workloads are takers because they don't have enough cash, assuming this sort of hierarchy. Uh, and we're talking about uh, the private caches over here, as you see. Uh, and there's uh, latencies that are simulated that are different. If it's basically 10-cycle latency for local hits. For remote hits, it's 40 cycles. So this doesn't consider the 
uh, even finer grain heterogeneity in the latency. You could have even finer grain heterogeneity based on which cache you're spilling to and which cache you're receiving from. But this paper doesn't consider that, as you see. Uh, okay, uh, and then you construct the workloads as givers and takers, and you look at different categories of givers and takers. And this workload, for example, there are four givers, no takers, uh, three givers, one taker, two givers, two takers. So you, you'd like to understand the differences. So if you look over here, this is the weighted speed up that you get. Uh, clearly, the weighted speed up is higher when you have all givers, meaning these have ample cache space. They're not using all of their cache space, right? They're givers in the sense that they're giving the cache space. They have extra cache. And uh, as you increase the number of givers, if, if, the, if all of the applications are takers, meaning that they do not have enough cache, they're, the weighted speed up of the system reduces, so that's expected. That's good. Uh, and if you look at the other uh, the different uh, cache management policies in each case, shared means LRU-based sharing, which means that there's no partitioning. Uh, baseline is no spilling uh, over here. Uh, that's private caches, basically. So this, this basically shows that across all 400, 495 workloads, you see private and shared are very similar uh, if you don't do anything about it. And dynamic spill receive uh, provides you higher performance, and it's higher performance in pretty much all categories, except if all of them are uh, givers in this case. Because there's enough cache space, there's no need to spill in that case, and you don't improve performance compared to private caches. But here, for example, if all of them are takers, meaning that there's not enough cash for anyone, you actually improve performance significantly because you dynamically figure out what to spill and what to receive based on how, those, uh, how the different applications are behaving. Basically, you adapt dynamically to the access pattern, even though individually these may be utilizing a lot of their cash because there, there's differences in the behavior of the applications. So this improves performance significantly, as you can see. And this was the previously proposed uh, uh, cooperative caching policy that doesn't take into account, that doesn't, take into account how much benefit you would get if you are spilling versus receiving, and it's randomly picked a line to, uh, to spill to, uh, to other caches, basically. It doesn't uh, consider, uh, it doesn't classify caches as spillers and receivers. Okay, so basically that's the idea over here, and uh, actually this is a different approach, as you can see, starting from the sh private cache approach and trying to spill and receive in an intelligent way uh, to caches around you. And it's actually also a good approach. Uh, this is implemented in some systems, a, ver a version of this. Uh, a version of cache partitioning is also implemented in some other systems. So it's, the jury is still out. There's still improvement that is needed in caching algorithms. So I've already talked about this, but caches are becoming increasingly distributed, if, especially if you want to put, let's say, hundreds of cores on a chip. Uh, you cannot have a cache that's huge, that services everything, so you basically distribute the cache. This is one example over here, and you put an interconnect, and if this, one, if this core wants to access uh, some other uh, portion of the shared cache, L2 slice, let's say, it needs to send a message to the network. Uh, and this is one example, as you can see. We're, we're going to talk about these more in interconnects when we get to that. Uh, but there are issues in caching for parallel applications. Also, I'm not going to go into the detail over here, but... Let's assume that you have a parallel application that's actually, uh, I think this is six, how many cores is this, 64? No, 32. Uh, in this 32, you're running 32 threads in this 32 cores, uh, and you have some sharing of data between, different, uh, between clusters of threads. Where do you place the data matters. So similar issues, uh, uh, data place, uh, like what we've discussed earlier for memory scheduling for parallel applications happen over here. And we're going to talk about heterogeneous multi-core later on, which we'll go into a little bit more detail over here. But basically, there have been a lot of algorithms that are developed to minimize communication on these distributed caches. Uh, if, if this thread is accessing some shared data, if this thread is also accessing some shared data, you don't want those, uh, the same data, and one is writing and one is reading, you don't want those threads to be mapped far away from each other because that causes a lot of network traffic and communication to update the caches. It's better if they are close to each other Ideally in the same core, of course, right? If you have simultaneous multi-threading, then you don't need to move the data at all. Uh, basically, data mapping becomes an important problem. Thread scheduling also becomes an important problem, uh, especially in this distributed cache system. Okay, that's one example over here, right? This core is accessing these two blocks and uh, how you map the data matters. Okay, basically shared data and locks ping pong between processors if caches are private. Uh, that's one issue with private caches. This increases the latency to fetch shared data or locks, 
and this reduces cache efficiency because there may be many invalid blocks, right? If, you're, um, if, you, if you have some shared data that you've written to, uh, now you need to invalidate everybody else's caches from those. So the, the cache uh, ends up having a lot of invalid blocks because of that data sharing. And this leads to a scalability problem because you ma you're maintaining coherence across a large number of private caches is costly, actually. Uh, so how to do better has been a question for many people. We're going to tackle some of that later on. Uh, one, thing, one idea uh, that is nice, actually, uh, which we will see in the next lecture, is store shared data and locks only in one special core's cache and divert all critical section execution to that core or that cache. You can generalize the idea to have it multiple cores. Let's say you dedicate two or three cores to e execute critical sections, and you kind of specialize them for that purpose, and share data and locks never leave that area. That way you minimize the coherence overhead uh, across the entire chip. And we will see the benefits of this idea later on uh, when we talk about heterogeneous multi-core, because this is essentially adding heterogeneity in terms of the functionality of the cores. You may be running a general purpose application, but share data stays only in these cores. Uh, you can think of this as a client-server model also, right? Whenever you want to execute a critical section on some data element that's shared, that's protected, you send a function to that particular core internally, and the core does the function on that data and returns the results back to you. We will see this. So they are very interesting concepts. It's essentially a remote procedure call that you do on chip uh, if, you, if you use this idea. Okay. And we'll, we'll talk about this in more detail. Of course, there are other ideas that you can uh, think about, but I like this one because this is a little bit out of the box, and it opens up other ways of thinking about the system. Uh, and this is also very much uh, mm, compatible with uh, a distributed system model in the larger scale. Distributed systems are programmed this way. You specialize some servers to do some tasks, and you send messages to those servers. And data locality is one of the examples of the tasks Meaning, oh, if you want to access this data, it's, it's housed in the server. And don't, go to, don't, don't pull the data out from that server. Just send the function to that server, and the, and the server executes that function. It's good to think about what other functions are possible to do. And if you actually think about this in a little bit more broadly, accelerators are nothing uh, different from this. Basically, accelerators are these cores that are specialized for functions, maybe extremely specialized. And whenever you want to do a particular function, you send uh, the function to that accelerator, and the accelerator does something and returns it back. So this is really about heterogeneity uh, in the end. But heterogeneity can help you deal with difficult problems like handling shared data. OK, any questions? This way, you don't need sharing, essentially. You have a private cache in that particular core. You make it huge, and you house the shared data uh, over there. OK. OK, so let's talk about some other cache concepts before we move to heterogeneous multi-core. So one issue is non-uniform cache access. We've already touched upon this. Large caches take a long time to access because you have wire delay. Uh, and even if you have a single monolithic cache, you may need to partition it. Actually, you do need to partition it uh, into uh, portions that have different latencies. So you can have closed by blocks that can be accessed faster. But furthest blocks determine the worst case access time. So the idea to fix, basically, you don't, want, uh, you don't want the entire cache to be accessed with the worst case access time because of the interconnect latency. This is very similar to DRM, like we discussed earlier, right? If your bit lines are very long, you're basically dominated by the latency of the bit lines. Well, what you can do is you can cut uh, your bit lines, segment them, such that the parts that are closer to uh, the sensing structures are accessed faster. Right? That's the idea over here in caches, again. You have variable access, latency access time in a single cache. You don't want uh, the worst case to determine your latency. Instead, part, uh, divide your cache into segments and have variable latency access time in a single cache. Uh, yeah, you partition cache into pieces. Each piece has a different latency. And then the question is, which piece does an address map to? That becomes uh, interesting, just like we saw in tiered latency DRAM, for example. You can have a static partitioning of addresses, or you can have a dynamic partitioning of addresses. Uh, basically, based on bits in the address, you determine which piece the address gets mapped to. But that may not be good, because uh, then you would like to map frequently accessed uh, data to the addresses that happen to get mapped to uh, fast blocks, or fast portions of the cache. Right? But that may not all, those blocks may also change over time. 
Uh, so people have looked at dynamic addressing schemes, where, which means that any address can map to any piece, which means that you need to now have a translation table from the address to where the address maps to uh, in the caches, which is much more overhead, of course. Uh, but now you have flexibility in management. You can say, OK, I, I put some counters. I say, oh, this block is accessed a lot. And very frequently, it's heavily used. So I'm going to move it from the slow portion of the cache to the fast portion of the cache. Right. Of course, that requires effort to move the block as well. Uh, so there are overheads. So it opens up a huge optimization space. How to locate an address? You need a mapping table. And how do you replace and place? Like when, whenever you're deciding, oh, this piece uh, has too much data in it, where do, you put the, uh, mm, uh, where do you put the data that you're evicting? To some other piece? Or do you actually get it out of the cache completely? So you can think of this as, uh, I think of this as a distributed cache, if I can pull this up somehow. Can you turn on the light from the back? Or maybe I'll do it. Oh. Okay. Light. I think I did it, but I'm not sure. Yeah, maybe you did it. Okay. So essentially, now we're just looking at the cache piece itself. You may have also cores associated with these tiles. And it becomes interesting, actually, because you can think of this as, let's say you have a core over here and then L2 cache piece. Let's say piece one, another core, uh, and then piece two, L2 piece two, dot, dot, dot. So from this core's perspective, uh, this cache is fast. This cache is a bit slower. This cache is a bit slower. And this cache is definitely the slowest, right, this piece. Now, when you have a cache block over here, a shared cache block, and you want to access it, you first need to figure out uh, where it is if you get a physical address, let's say, uh, for a cache block, cache line one. You first need to figure out where it is. It could be anywhere, right? With a dynamic scheme, it's actually much worse because you need to consult a table to figure out where it is. If it's static, it's easy, basically, by looking at the address bits, you figure out which, uh, which of these, I don't know, 16 uh, uh, L2 pieces does this address belong to? And this could be four bits, for example, that you look at. Now you, could do, you could use all the tricks that we discussed, like hashing, for example. But with the dynamic scheme, it's, uh, it's not easy, because where do you put that table becomes a problem to begin with. right? And then there are other issues, like whenever you want to evict something from this particular part of the cache, what do you do with it? Uh, do you actually evict it to a nearby cache, spill it, in a sense? Do you evict it far away? Do you get rid of it in the system? So there are many, many questions that open up over here. And there is a bunch of literature on this that we're not going to cover. But existing systems need to tackle issues like this somehow. Usually in today's systems, if you have a distributed on-chip cache, it's very simple. It's based on static mapping. You basically take some bits out of the address and you statically map, which means that if this core is always accessing some address that happens to map to this cache, it's always paying the latency penalty to access that cache, plus the congestion in the network, everything we discussed when we looked at a system like this uh, early on. You need to do your data mapping and threat scheduling well if you want to get rid of it. But if you had a more flexible mapping scheme that takes the address and translates it to the cache block location, if you will, over here, then you may actually optimize more. But then the system complexity goes up. So there's a lot more work to be done in this area. That's my point over here. Because there are many, many questions. And I didn't ask all of the questions that are present uh, in this system. But you can imagine some things, right? For example, when you prefetch data, where do you prefetch to? Do you prefetch directly over here? Or do you prefetch to a closed by cache? If you prefetch to a closed by cache, it may be good if that cache has space, for example. Uh, if, you're not, if you're not going to use the data immediately. So it's a very complex optimization problem. Any questions? I'm just giving you problems right now, not answers. <laughs> OK, thank you. OK, and this is the paper that first introduced the idea uh, of uh, this non-uniform uh, uh, access latency, mainly be to, because of the wire delay. And in the, in the end, access latency is not always, but a lot of the times dominated by your interconnect. 
your interconnect is very important uh, because there's no, no way you can transport the data without a long interconnect if you want a large structure. Right? We haven't figured out how to magically trans, uh, uh, transport the data uh, without an interconnect. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's. Uh, I'm skipping between topics, but they're all related to caches. So multi-core, we said that cache efficiency becomes even more important. Uh, it's good to think about in multi-core, L1 caches are actually bandwidth filters. Caches act as a filter that reduces the memory bandwidth requirement. When you get a cache hit, there's no need to access memory, so your contention reduces in the system, uh, and you get that benefit in addition to the latency reduction benefit of caching. So if you're bandwidth constrained, this is actually a really important benefit. I think at some point, if you, were, if you wanted to take a job at NVIDIA, uh, they liked asking these questions where uh, they say, oh, we have caches in our GPUs. Why do you think that is? <laughs> and a good answer definitely was, oh, you need a lot of memory bandwidth because of all this parallelism. And if your caching is just a little bit effective, you reduce the memory bandwidth requirement uh, from, uh, that, that's, that is needed uh, from memory. And that's exactly why they added caches into the GPUs, to get rid of a lot of the bandwidth need even though many of their applications didn't have really, really good locality, uh, because they could actually stream uh, data in also. But there was locality, of course. So OK, this is, in clear, this is obvious, right? Because you don't need to access memory. Uh, and I said this already. Uh, uh, so efficient utilization of cache space clearly becomes more important with multi-core. Memory bandwidth is more valuable, because we, as we've already discussed, pin count is not increasing as fast as the number of transistors. And this is, if you don't consider 3D stacking technologies, bandwidth is increasing by about 10% per year, whereas pin count is, uh, yeah, that's the pin count actually, whereas number of transistors is increasing by about 2x every two years or so. Uh, of course, you could argue with these numbers right now, right? You need to do the study. It's all empirical. And more cores put pressure on the memory bandwidth, as you know. So basically, how to make the bandwidth filtering effect of caches better. Uh, that's why we're going to talk about efficient cache utilization a little bit. And we're going to especially think about L2 caches and beyond. But L1 caches are important also. But there's only limited things that you can do in the L1 level. Because L1 is very tightly coupled to the pipeline. You want uh, to design L1 to be very high frequency. OK, so we're going to look at efficient cache utilization. We're going to cover some examples. I don't know how much we're going to cover. It will depend on uh, your questions also. And also how much time we leave for the next lecture. I'll start with some. Different idea. Uh, of course, the, some of these ideas, MLP aware cache replacement we've discussed, you basically are more cost aware. Uh, these are uh, interesting insertion and replacement policies to minimize the waste in the caches. And they're actually very interesting ideas. I'm going to go over them briefly. But I'm going to talk about a completely different idea, uh, which basically exploits uh, data redundancy in caches. There's a lot of redundant data in caches. Why are we storing all of that redundant data in a redundant manner? Why don't we consolidate it somehow? So that's the idea of cache compression. And again, the concept is very general. You, employ, you can employ compression at many, many systems. Caches are a little bit harder of a place to apply it. Uh, but this paper proposed a very simple mechanism uh, uh, to do it. And the motivation is, clearly, we have a lot of redundancy in data. Actually, if you examine uh, systems, uh, many papers reported in the past that 30% of the memory is just storing zeros. Maybe more, depending on your application. This is one example. You have significant redundancy in data. For example, you're storing uh, uh, integers that happen to have narrow values uh, in a 32-bit integer uh, structure in your programming language. But you don't need really 32 bits. You just need you know, 8 bits down here. In this case, you don't, you don't need more than, uh, actually, what? yeah, this is actually a byte right at the bottom. You, you don't need more than a byte in this case. right? So cache compression helps because it provides the effect of a larger cache without making the cache physically larger. Of course, you need to modify the structure of the cache somehow. So this is an example. You basically uh, go to your L2 cache, uh, you get a hit, you get uncompressed data. That's what, I, what we've been assuming so far, right? But if, you, if your L2 cache is compressed, you need to go through a decompression engine so that you can get uncompressed data, which means that decompression is on the critical path of your access, right? If you missed in your L1 cache, decompression is your critical. And if you actually put it between, if, you, if your L1 cache is compressed, then you need to have a decompression engine before you get the data into the CPU. So this paper makes the design choice that, oh, it's more important to keep the compression in L2, have L1 not so compressed, 
and pay the penalty only on an L1 miss. Because L1 hits, every time you hit an L1, if you go through the decompression uh, latency, that's always on your critical path, right? That's the design choice that's made over here. And I think it's a good design choice in general. So the key requirements, if you want to have a uh, compressed cache, is you want to be fast, low decompression latency. You want to be simple. You don't want very complicated compression algorithms because you're not doing things in software. You're, you need to implement compression in hardware in this case. And of course, you want to have, achieve a good compression ratio to get benefits out of it. You want it to be effective, right? Uh, okay, I'm not going to go through this in detail. There are a bunch of mechanisms that are proposed in the past. For example, one idea is zero compression. Just compress the zeros in some way and code the zeros in a different way. In this case, the compression latency is good, complexity is low, but compression ratio is not high, as we will see. Uh, frequent value compression, that's another idea that's been proposed. Uh, basically, determine the frequent values in your cache and compress only them. Somehow. You can read the papers related to that, right? You can imagine periodically you sample the cache and you figure out what are the most frequent values, or you do it statically. You say, I'm going to encode zeros, uh, a zero cache block uh, uh, in the tax store. Let's say a zero tax uh, cache block is not going to occupy uh, a way in the cache. But in the tax store, uh, I will say, OK, I have a zero cache block in this particular location, and it's just a single bit. That says you still have the tag, um, and uh, you just basically add a single bit to the tag saying that, oh, this is actually all zeros. That's a very simple mechanism to do the zero compression. If you want to do frequent value compression in a static way or a dynamic way, you, you add multiple bits saying, OK, this particular value is encoded as zero, zero. This particular value is encoded as zero, one, dot, dot, dot. And then you have another table that says, OK, zero, zero corresponds to this, zero, one corresponds to this, zero, one, zero corresponds to this. So these are easy mechanisms to implement. Uh, well, maybe this one is not so easy if you do it dynamically. If you do it statically, maybe it's not so bad, but you don't get a lot of, you don't get good compression ratio if you do it statically. Of course, you need to change the cache structure, as we will discuss, because you're using one tag. So you need to actually have more tags than the number of blocks that you can actually store, in a way. Because one is, if, if one is compressed, then you're not going to store it in the block, but you need a tag to actually identify other blocks. OK, so I'm giving you the basic ideas, even though I said I'm not going to go into detail. But these are very simple concepts, as you can see. Uh, you can do these. Uh, frequent value compression, decompression latency is actually long. Uh, you can read the paper for more details, if you want to do it dynamically, especially. And there's also frequent pattern compression, which I'm not going to go into detail. But this, is, this doesn't encode direct values, but this encodes patterns, like some value plus uh, something else. Uh, but you can take a look at it also. I'm going to describe a mechanism that's much simpler. Uh, than uh, these two over here, and that gets you much more benefit than just your compression. And we'll talk about that. Uh, we, this may be, uh, it's actually a cool paper. My, one of my PhD students' thesis was on uh, compression in memory. Not only caches, but caches interconnect main memory. And this is part of that. Uh, so we've already discussed this. The problem, one of the big problems with uh, compressed caches is decompression is on the critical path. And this work proposed a new compression scheme that has low decompression latency, low cost, and high compression ratio. The observation is very simple. Many cache lines have low dynamic range data. And we're going to talk about what that is. Uh, we're going to encode those cache lines as a base plus multiple differences from that base. Low dynamic range meaning, means that uh, if you identify a base, the values differ very little from that base. So we saw the uh, narrow values. They differ very, for, uh, very little from zero, for example. You could think of pointers, as we will see. Pointers differ very, very little from some base address. But then you can encode the cache line as a base plus multiple differences from that. And that gets you low decompression latency. And it turns out high decompression ratio also. And we will see that. So let's take a look at these data patterns in real applications that are compressible. So zero values are obviously, if you initialized a huge portion of your memory, just a cache block is enough, you get all zeros. Clearly, sparse matrices also have this, null pointers have this. You can have repeated values, you can have common initial values, adjacent pixels, for example, in video. Uh, you get something that looks like this. You get narrow values, you may have small values, dynamically small values, that happen to be stored in a big data type because the programmer didn't use a small data type or they didn't have access to the small data type, or the or they thought the values would be large, so they used a large integer, except the values happen to be small dynamically most of the time. Right? So there's no programming error, uh, 
mistake here, uh, but happen, uh, values happen to be narrow for whatever reason. And there could be other patterns, like pointers to the same memory region, right? Then the data looks like this. You basically have some base address, and then you have some delta from that pointer. So if you look at the, what is the common thing in all of these, is it's low dynamic range. And this is one study that, from the paper that basically shows if you actually look at the cache, if you sample the cache, and if you look at the contents of the cache, what fraction of those contents are zero values, repeated values, and the other patterns? And this basically shows that a lot of the fraction is zeros in some of these workloads. It's not so much in some of the other ones. And a lot of the fraction are actually repeated values, and all of them are other patterns that are compressible, uh, like other patterns over here. So a significant fraction of your cache should be compressible somehow because there's a lot of redundancy or there's a lot of wastage, as you can see over here. And on average, it's about 45%, I guess, over here. Uh, 43, there you go. <laughs> so what's common across all of these is they have low dynamic range. The differences between values are significantly smaller than the values themselves. So the key question is, can we exploit this? And the idea is yes. Uh, the basic idea is base delta encoding, and it's going to be enhanced. So you have a base. If you look at a 32-byte uncompressed cache line, because it's no pointers over here, you basically, let's say you pick the first cache line as a base, uh, for first four bytes in the cache block as a base. You can encode everything else as differences from that base, as you can see over here. That's the delta. So each of the other well, the first block is def clearly the same as the base, so the difference between the first block and the base is zero. The di uh, when I say block, in this case, it's really a four-byte word, but it could be arbitrary, as we will see in a little bit. You basically look at four-byte chunks of the cache block and encode each chunk as a difference from that base. And if you do that, you just need two uh, one byte per chunk and then four bytes for the base. As a result, you get a 12-byte compressed cache line you don't need the 32 bytes to store. That's a significant reduction uh, in the amount of data that you need to store. So you save 20 bytes. And so this is actually a fast decompression. If you want to decompress this over here, you just need to take the base and add it to each of the deltas in a vector manner. So it's a very simple vector addition to reconstruct uh, all of the values whenever you fetch uh, this compressed cache block. It's simple because you just need arithmetic and comparison. Uh, comparison. Of course, encoding requires some work. Uh, and it turns out it's effective. It has good compression ratio. Uh, so can we do better? Uh, the, uh, so if you look over here in this cache block, if you use a single base, so there's also the question, how do you select the base, which you didn't cover. We may get to it. But if you use a single base, let's say the first, cache, uh, first chunk over here, if you use that, this becomes uncompressible, right? Because this is a huge value over here. There's a huge delta between this base and this. So there, uh, but the realization is that you could actually have two bases over here to encode this. Right? Use more bases, two instead of one. More cache lines can be compressed. The con is, how do you find two bases efficiently now? Because whenever you're encoding a cache block, you need to identify, OK, this is one base and this is another base, maybe the third base, I don't know, maybe a fourth one. But as you keep adding bases, you get higher overhead, right? because you need to actually store those bases somewhere also. So if you actually do the study, uh, uh, if you have multiple arbitrary bases, starting from 1 to 2, going up to all the way an unrealistic 1.16, uh, 16 probably, uh, this is the compression ratio that you get when you take into account the additional overhead, of course, that is introduced by storing the bases. So it, it turns out uh, having two bases gets you, gets you a much better compression ratio than having one base, because it gets rid of uh, uncompressible cache blocks if you had only one base. In this case, you, you just need two bases if this is the pattern that you see. Having three bases actually makes more cache blocks compressible, but the overhead of the extra base gets rid of uh, the benefit that's coming from more compressibility. So it's very interesting. So overall, the choice in this paper is not two bases, as we will discuss. So the best option is based on evaluations, two bases. But there's a trick. Uh, that this paper plays uh, that says first base, okay, we're going to say it's the first element, first non-zero element in the cache line. That's the base plus delta part. And the second base, it turns out zero is so, uh, narrow values are so common 
that the, the implicit base is zero. So you have two bases. One is always fixed hardwired to zero, and the other is found when you bring the cache block. It's the first non-zero element in the cache line. And what's an element? We will see the uh, decoding part. You basically look at multiple different sizes of elements, 4 bytes, 8 bytes, 16 bytes, and you pick the one that's providing you the best compression ratio. Okay, that's the immediate part. Basically, now, instead of having two arbitrary bases, uh, you actually have one implicit base, which you, which you don't need to store. If the cache block is encoded, you know that one base is zero, uh, and one uh, base that you find. So you get better compression ratio compared to two arbitrary bases, and you get simpler compression logic. Of course, this better compression ratio is empirical. right? And that's called base delta immediate compression. And if you actually do this empirical study, where you have two arbitrary bases, the compression ratio that you get is about 1.5x. This basically means that the same amount of storage that you have looks like 1.5x bigger. And uh, base delta immediate actually increases a little bit. It's not always better, as you can see, because it really depends on the distribution of zeros uh, uh, as a base in your cache block. But sometimes it's better. OK, so every compression ratio is close. Base delta immediate is slightly better, and it's also simpler. So uh, there's an implementation, of course. Now you need to actually change the cache design slightly. You need to have a decompressor. You need to have a compressor and the organization. So the organization is the hardest part, actually, because that changes the cache design uh, more. Decompressor and compressor can be outside the cache uh, after you get the cache block. Uh, so of course, these need to be, the compressor should be low latency. Compressor can be high latency, but it should be low cost and complexity, right? because it's not on the critical path, compression. Uh, so decompressor, as we discussed, it's really, uh, this is base delta. Uh, it's essentially uh, this. You have a compressed cache line, uh, and you add the base uh, to the deltas. It's a vector addition. And if you actually want to have two bases, one implicit to zero, it's a masked vector addition, right? Uh, you know masked additions, right? Now it's a masked vector addition, which is easy. And I'm not going to go through this in detail, because this is kind of obvious. And you construct the uncompressed cache line. Compressor is a little bit harder. Basically, compressors, in pretty much all cases, need to try out different possibilities for compression if you want to get a good compression ratio. For example, this is, uh, this is a particular compression unit that assumes an 8-byte base, uh, B0, and 1-byte deltas. This uh, another compression unit. And it tries to encode the cache block that way. This assumes an 8-byte base 0 and 2-byte deltas. 8-byte base 0, 4-byte deltas, and 4-byte base 0, 1-byte deltas, dot, 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 right? This is just particular design choice. And, uh, and then you can have a zero compression unit that looks at whether the whole cache line is zero, and a repeated values compression unit that basically looks like whether or not you have repeated values in the cache block. So these are separate, simple compression units. And then all of them output a compression flag. Is it compressible this way? And the compressed cache block. And then... Yeah, compressed cache line. And then basically there's a selection logic that compares each of these and picks the one that's the most effective in terms of compressed cache block size. And if, uh, if it decides to uh, compress the cache block, it gives you a compressed cache line. Because it may, not it may say none of this is useful, so just encode the cache line as an uncompressed cache line, right? Because you may not be able to compress it. OK. So this is one example of the compression unit. Uh, it's, again, a vector subtraction in this case. Uh, you basically pick your base first and then subtract the base from these elements. In this case, this particular compression unit assumes that you have 8-byte elements and 1-byte deltas. So it's basically simple vector operations that you do uh, to construct uh, and deconstruct, uh, reconstruct the cells. And basically, you have the deltas, and this compression unit checks whether the delta is within the 1-byte range. Because if it's not, this cache block is not compressible in this format. Is if every element is within one byte range, it basically gives out the compressed cache line as this. If not, it says this is not compressible with this particular unit. OK, so cache organization is another thing that should change. Uh, if you look at a conventional two-way cache with 32-byte cache lines, uh, there is a tight coupling between the ways and the blocks. Right? You can actually store. Uh, one block in one way. And the data storage looks like this. Basically, you have the fixed, uh, 60, let's say, 32-byte block over here and then 32-byte block over there. There's no flexibility. So there's no way, way you can store 12-byte blocks. Right? So 
So you need to add flexibility, basically. Uh, and there's no flexibility uh, from the, in this mapping, as you can see. If you put this tag over here, that corresponds to this data over here. If you put this tag here, that corresponds to this data over here. So basically, we need to add flexibility, meaning that if some tag, uh, if some blo uh, if if some uh, blocks are compressed, you should be able to accommodate many blocks over here. If you want to accommodate many blocks, you need to have more tags to address those blocks in the cache. As a result, you will really need to increase the tag storage. There, as far as I know, there's no other way of doing this. You need to have more tags to encode the fact that you're storing more blocks in the cache now. And this is one example. You basically say, I can store at most four blocks in the cache. That's the design choice. And I'm going to use this 64 bytes over here in a way such that I can distribute those 64 bytes in different ways to those four blocks. So let's take a look at that. So basically, you have some, also in the tag store, you need to have compression encoding bits that specify how this particular uh, data block associated with this tag is compressed. Hopefully that's obvious. And now we're going to reorganize data store a little bit, such that we can essentially uh, map uh, the blocks that is associated with a tag to consecutive adjacent segments. Basically, as opposed to having 32-byte blocks, now we have 8-byte segments, and basically say, oh, this particular block that's associated with this tag starts from segment 4 and ends at segment 6. So it's essentially a 24-byte cache block in this case. Basically, start and end pointers uh, are needed to identify wh where the block associated with this tag is. But of course, if the tag uh, says this particular block is zero, you don't need to allocate any segments to that particular block. The compression encoding bits that I mentioned over here says, OK, this is a zero block. And you don't waste any cache space to store that block. You get a zero out of the tag store directly. You can even optimize your cache latency that way. Right? You don't need to wait for the data, for example. OK, that's the idea. This is one way of organizing uh, uh, a compressed cache without making a lot of changes to the cache structure. Right? Remember, uh, if you look at it, we, don't, we didn't change the tag structure that much. We added more tags. We didn't change this that much. You could actually make a lot more changes. There are proposals that say, OK, you get an address. An address can map anywhere in the cache. Now it's not a, a set associative cache. It's really a fully associative cache in that case. But you need to have a big table. It's, it's a, essentially, it's called an indirect index cache. If you're interested, you can take a look at it. OK, the overhead is still high, actually. For a 2 megabyte cache, it's about 2.3% overhead. You may think this is low, but this is actually an important part of the processor. Uh, and the paper has more uh, details. So there is some qualitative comparison with prior works. You can take a look at it in the paper. As we've already discussed this. If you're just compressing zeros, it's not enough. There are not enough zeros. Zeros are not the only thing that's compressible. If you if do frequent value compression, it's higher compression latency and complexity. And pattern-based compression designs with references, you can take a look at it. They're usually high decompression latency. So we wanted to re reduce the decompression latency. If you look at the cache compression ratios, it's a different story. Uh, basically, these actually do pretty well compared to zero compression, especially frequent pattern compression. But it turns out in this particular workload set, base delta immediate compression actually is slightly better. OK, let's take a look at the benefit that you would get uh, if you do this sort of compression. Uh, so essentially, uh, compared to no, not compressed cache, you get significant performance improvement. And this is a single core performance improvement. Single core performance is not easy to improve, uh, especially these days. Uh, so you get averaged across many workloads about 5%, let's say, depending on your cache size, of course. If your cache size is huge, then you may not get enough benefit. Uh, as, your, as your cache size increases, the benefit you get becomes lower, as expected. Uh, but there's another interesting thing over here. If you essentially, uh, the base delta immediate compression with a half size cache provides you almost the same performance as a double size cache. Right. Essentially, you're getting more out of the space that you have, <laughs> as expected again. It's not always true, of course, right? For example, in, th in this case, it's true. Actually, with two megabyte cache, compressed cache, you're getting more performance than a four megabyte cache provides you. But you're not, uh, you, this, this, this doesn't hold uh, when you go to an 8 megabyte compressed cache. It's not buying you the same benefit as a 16 megabyte not compressed cache. But OK, on average, you can make this claim, <laughs> approximately. And this is another example. Basically, where is the benefit coming from? You're reducing the miss rates. 
So this is the miss rate that you get normalized to a 512 kilobyte cache. Uh, adding compression reduces your miss rate, and your miss rate reduction becomes slightly lower as you increase, but there is no relation over here. But performance is really the interesting thing to examine over here. But uh, this, this gives you a nice curve, as you can see. OK, multi-core workloads. Uh, this paper actually classifies the workloads. I like this sort of classification when you do these studies. This basically looks at the compressibility. Applications are classified based on their compressibility, meaning effects of cache size increase if you apply compression to this application. Uh, some of them have high compressibility. Some of them have low compressibility. And it also looks at the sensitivity. And these are completely orthogonal domains. Uh, performance gain with more cache. Uh, uh, and applications are classified based on low sensitivity and high sensitivity. And you have three classes of applications. It turns out there are no low compressibility and high sensitivity applications in our workload set, and you can classify it this way. And the paper basically constructs uh, two core random mixes of each possible class pairs, 20 each, 120 total workloads. And let's take a look at what uh, you would get. So these are applications that have low sensitivity, so you would not expect uh, Basically, both of the workloads and the uh, uh, both of the applications in the workload has low sensitivity to cache size, meaning that even if, you, if they're compressible, even if you have something compressible, you would not expect a lot of benefit, and that's essentially true, because more cache size doesn't help these applications as much as some other applications. You still get benefit, that's good, but not as much. If you look at these high sensitivity workloads, you gain significant benefits when all of the applications are uh, actually when you have this sort of combination. Basically, both applications are high comp highly compressible and also highly sensitive to the cache size. So you get 18% performance improvement. Uh, in this case, uh, one application is low, compre low compressibility and low sensitivity. One application has high compressibility and high sensitivity. You still get benefit, but not as much as the case where both applications have this high compressibility and high sensitivity. So it's good to, whenever you analyze results, it's always good to actually do this sort of categorization because this gives a lot of insight into where the performance gains are coming from. Clearly, you won't expect a lot of performance benefit, and you prove that you don't have a lot of performance benefit over there. OK, so it's a simple idea, as you can see, right? Uh, and we covered a lot on it, but there are more, there's more stuff. So there's actually other benefits of compression that we didn't discuss. Uh, you can read the paper for that. But basically, bandwidth consumption is an important benefit. Uh, you get significant decrease in bandwidth consumption, which is power consumption, essentially, which is not evaluated in this paper. So compression actually enables you other benefits that are not evaluated. OK, I think we're done with this one. Any questions? Well, maybe you can come up with, a, with the next compression algorithm. This is actually really fascinating, I think, uh, especially if you have this hard, uh, low complexity constraint. Because there are many, many compression algorithms, clearly, in software. And we use them. And this paper actually evaluated. Later, we evaluated LZ. Uh, w compression also in this particular work because in main memory it becomes interesting to look at more software based more complicated uh, compression algorithms although base delta immediate compression actually is applicable to main memory also uh, but having this hardware low power low complexity low latency constraint actually uh, big, makes makes compression even more interesting I think and Gennady uh, has, has has done his thesis on this and I'm going to flash some of the papers uh, that he's looked at. Uh, but I'm not going to go, we're, going to, we're not going to go over this, basically. So this is actually interesting. In this work, uh, uh, yeah, we've, uh, one of the downsides of compression is it increased the entropy uh, in the data that you have. Uh, meaning that if you're transmitting always zeros, let's say, you're really not switching your interconnect much. But if you're co always compressing, uh, compressing your data, then your entropy increases, so you're switching the... Uh, uh, interconnects wires a lot. And that, it turns out, there's a trade-off. Sometimes you're switching the wires so much more that it increases your energy consumption, especially in GPUs where, interconnect, where you have a lot of interconnects. And this paper explores that uh, interesting uh, trade-off between uh, higher cache capacity and increased entropy in the interconnect increase, uh, to, to, to re receive a balance. And this is actually interesting because uh, we've actually analyzed a lot of the workloads that NVIDIA has, uh, both for uh, discrete GPUs as well as for mobile uh, GPUs. So, uh, if you're interested in this, you can take a look at it. But we don't have time to cover it. In this work, uh, one of my other students, Nandita, looked at how do you actually do this compression in a much more flexible way. 
And this paper basically introduces the idea of using assist warps in a GPU. These are warps that are not part of your program, but these are helper warps that are launched, for example, to decompress data from the cache or compress data into the cache that essentially assist the program to achieve higher performance. This is based on the idea of assist threads or helper threads that have also been employed in CPUs. But this is a, uh, you can also employ it in GPUs to get rid of the, or to reduce the bandwidth bottleneck. So the main benefit over here was reducing the bandwidth bottleneck in GPUs. OK. Any questions? If no questions, maybe we should take a break over here. I'll take a relatively short break today. Let's be back at 125, and then we'll take another break uh, later on. Sound good? OK, let's continue. Uh, we're going a bit slowly, but hopefully uh, we're covering some really interesting ideas. Uh, the the not-so-good news is that we're not going to be able to cover all the material that I expect to cover in the entire uh, semester, but that's OK. I'll, po I'll give you pointers if you're interested in particular things. Uh, I want to cover some more in caching. Uh, I'll start with this idea, which is actually really interesting also. Uh, basically, we want to efficiently utilize the caches. Uh, so when your caches are a very prime resource, it's always good to revisit the idea of cache placement and insertion. Uh, one key question is inserting a fetched or prefetched block into the cache or the entire hierarchy, always a good idea. And you already know the answer to that. It's, not a, it's a no, right? Uh, we, for example, done no allocate on write. Uh, that doesn't allocate a block on a write miss. Right? We've already seen some of these policies. How about reads? So for reads, you can actually do a prediction. Uh, so you can allocate on a read miss. This evicts another potentially useful cache block, but incoming block potentially more useful. And then you can do a trade-off analysis, as we've seen with MLP or cache replacement, as an example. So ideally, you would like to do this really well, of course, but it's not so easy to do it really well. You would like to place those blocks whose caching would be most useful in the future. Uh, and we certainly do not want to cache never to be used blocks uh, in the cache. But existing caches are actually very, very inefficient in this. And this is essentially optimal cache replacement. And as we discussed, you may optimize for miss rate, which is not even good enough. You really want to optimize for the stall time that you have. But that's much harder to predict, of course. right? So uh, there are a bunch of ideas over here. Uh, one basic idea is you predict in hardware, blocks that are not going to be used. And this is actually a relatively old idea. One of the earliest papers in hardware is uh, this one in micro in 1995, as you can see. Uh, it has a very simple prediction mechanism. This is another example. This actually introduces the dead block prediction, but this also looks at dead block prediction. Basically, a lot of blocks are dead in the cache. I've done these studies myself, actually, at companies that I worked at, and I've seen even in L1 caches, more than 70% of the blocks are dead. That's fascinating to me. <laughs> you bring all of these blocks, you touch them once, after that they're dead. They're dead after, if you look at the contents of the cache at that point in time. What does dead mean? It's not going to be used before it's going to be evicted, basically. And in, in the L2 caches, L3 caches, there's another problem. It's not just dead. You may have blocks that are dead on arrival meaning you insert the block into the cache, but it's never going to be used again. Well, never going to be used at all, because it's used in the L1 cache. You're also inserting into the L1 cache. It's used in the L1 cache. You insert in the L2, L3, L4, let's say. You basically wasted space in your L2, L3, L4, because you're never going to touch that block. So that's a big problem. It's a lot of wastage of space. Uh, and I want to distinguish between dead blocks and dead on arrival blocks. Dead on arrival means whenever it's arrived, it's already dead because some other cache is filtering out the locality that's present in that block. So you could also do, use software. A programmer or a compiler may mark the instructions that touch the data that's not going to be reused. Actually, we already have uh, instructions like that, non-temporal locality instructions. Uh, you can specify in the ISAs. They don't always perfectly work well, but you could potentially do this. right? Uh, so how does the software determine this is always a problem, of course, right? Uh, you need to really have good insight into the program. And it's not always easy to do this locality analysis. Programmer may have good insight. You can punt it onto the compiler, but compilers are not extremely good at locality analysis today. 
they do some things, but they're not perfect. For simple programs, yes, locality analysis is not that hard. But if you have a very complicated program, so if you're doing just matrix multiplication, maybe that's not that so hard. That's been optimized very, very heavily, actually. But if you're doing something much more complicated, uh, like a huge database with a lot of dependencies, then there's a problem over there. Or browser, for example, Chrome, Chrome browser. Uh, we've discussed that when we talk about processing in memory. It's not a simple piece of software. Uh, it doesn't do just matrix multiplication, for example. So determining this is not so easy. So people have looked at hardware uh, mechanisms. So uh, there's also streaming versus non-streaming accesses. A lot of people try to distinguish between them. If you're streaming through data, reuse likely occurs only for a limited period of time because you're touching that data and you're moving on to some other piece of data. So L1 caches are usually very effective. In fact, some people propose if you're doing streaming, you just keep prefetching the data into buffers. Don't even have caches. And that prefetcher works really nicely, assuming your streaming pattern is regular, of course. Uh, and you don't even need caches for streaming data. As we, at some point, I said, I think you, you can start with a tape, and you can just buffer the data coming from the tape. As long as you have enough bandwidth to satisfy the streaming requirements, then you just need a small buffer for that. So if you somehow identify such instructions that are just streaming, and you can, if you mark them uh, with, by the software, the hardware can store them temporarily in a smaller buffer, L0 cache instead of the cache. So you could actually optimize your program this way if you have that sort of visibility in, in the ar microarchitecture. So this is an example, actually. This is uh, uh, from the paper that I'm going to discuss uh, later on. This basically shows that more than 60% of the blocks in an L2 cache in a one megabyte, 16 way L2 cache, are dead on arrival. Uh, blocks that are unused between insertion and eviction, basically. And this is a single core application. Uh, basically, you have ineffective use of the cache space. So why do you have these dead on arrival blocks? One of the reasons is you have streaming data. This is never reused. L2 cache don't help. L1 caches may help over here. While the data is in the L1 cache, you, you basically filter out the locality of the data. L2 caches never see that, those accesses. So there, and the second reason is you have working set of the application that's greater than the cache size. That was one example over here. Uh, uh, in this case, for example, if you have a cache size that's one megabyte, the working set of the application is greater than the cache size, as you can see, because the application would benefit from caching. But it's not really benefiting from caching over here, although it's benefiting much better than this application, if you look over here. The same cache size over here for this MCF application, which is a famous application, it's a vehicle scheduling application. Uh, very high cache miss rate, as you can see. It's really not benefiting from the cache, even if you give it the full one megabytes over here. And to be able to really benefit from the cache, you need almost a four megabyte cache over here. So you have the working set of the application that's greater than the cache size. If the working set is greater than the cache size, maybe retaining some working set helps, in this case at least. Right? So uh, let's take a look at how insertion policies handle some of these applications. You have most recently used, least recently used. Uh, if you want to reference a block I with the traditional LRU policy, you basically insert it into the most recently used position. right? And uh, this is good if you expect this I to be reused a lot. Right. But if you don't expect I to be reused a lot, maybe you should not insert it into the cache. That's one example. Or you insert it with a very low priority into the cache. This is called the LRU insertion policy. You don't insert into the MRU position, you insert into the LRU position over here. You basically kick out, uh, uh, yeah, kick out H. In, in both cases, you kick out H. But which position do you insert this I? What is the priority of I compared to the blocks that are already in the cache is very different. In this case, it's the highest priority when it's inserted. In this case, it's the lowest priority when it's inserted. So now we have two different policies that are relatively simple uh, changes to the LR, uh, traditional pol LRU policy. Can you actually make use of that uh, some way? So lines basically do not enter non-LRU positions unless they're reused in this case. So if you actually have dead on arrival lines, if you insert them into the LRU position, lowest priority, they're not going to affect your cache as much because they're going to get kicked out in the next access if they're not going to be reused before that. Whereas here, if you insert a dead on arrival cache block into the highest priority, it makes its way to the lowest priority after a lot of accesses to that particular cache set. Right. So that's the difference. 
Uh, and this paper introduces uh, a new insertion policy called bimodal insertion policy by uh, exploiting the differences between these two extreme cases. Uh, basically, uh, the idea is to uh, insert into the LRU pos position as a default, saying that, oh, okay, you're streaming most of the time, unless you find otherwise. Uh, but you also infrequently insert lines into the MRU position. So I basically have a bimodal throttling parameter. You flip a coin. If the random number that you generate is less than some epsilon, which is a small probability, one hour out of 32, let's say, you insert at the MRU position. Otherwise, you insert at the LRU position. This way, if the application is streaming, you've limited its impact. If the application has a working set that benefits, eventually it will populate the cache with its working set because it will insert enough stuff into the MRU position. That's the idea over here. So basically, uh, this bimodal insertion policy retains a thrashing protection of the line, uh, this uh, LRU insertion policy. So LRU insertion policy protects you from thrashing. If an application is streaming, it essentially thrashes the entire set, but you limit the thrashing because you always insert at the LRU position. You never insert at the MRU position. But it, you also want to respond to the changes in working set, as we will see in the next slide. Uh, you basically want to keep some of your working sets inside the cache, and this probabilistic approach enables that uh, for you. So let's take a look at one analysis very quickly. Let's assume that we have a reference stream that has t blocks and repeats n times, and the cache has k blocks, and k is less than t over here. And basically assume that this is executed forever. And if you look at cache hit rates of two consecutive reference streams, meaning that you do this first, and then you do this next. Uh, these are the hit rates that you would get. So if you do this, if LRU is basically the vanilla LRU that we've discussed in class. Uh, cache has k blocks, and k is less than uh, t. Assume that it's a fully associated with cache. Don't think about sets at this point. Basically, because this is thrashing the cache, because you have t elements and cache has much fewer blocks, you get zero hit rate with the LRU insertion policy. And then you move to this one, you get zero hit rate on that one also. Right? Not good, right? This is the downside of LRU. You basically get zero hit rate if your access pattern is greater than your cache size. If you do the optimal, if you do the calculation, basically you get k minus 1 over t in both cases because it's a repeating pattern. Uh, and essentially, uh, yeah, you can do the calculation yourself. If you do uh, uh, this LRU insertion policy, which is unfortunately misnamed, I think. It should be low priority insertion policy. Let's call it low priority insertion policy. Uh, you basically insert every cache block into the LRU position. You get this nice hit rate over here, uh, but you get zero hit rate over here. Uh, and you can do the analysis yourself. But if you use BIP over here, uh, basically you get very close to the optimal hit rate. Because what you're doing is you can think about it this way. If you actually iterate over this many, many times, uh, you keep enough stuff into the, uh, you insert enough blocks into the uh, cache that is going to be reused at some point if you use this MRU uh, policy. So uh, basically, you, 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 you have k blocks in the cache. One of them is the lowest priority. You keep changing the lowest priority one very frequently. The rest, you keep inserting to MRU position very infrequently, but you populate your cache, the K blocks, with blocks that are going to be hopefully useful in some iteration. And most of the thrashing is protected by the fact that you're inserting into the uh, lowest priority position. Does that make sense? So if you're really scanning, most of the uh, time scanned is not really affecting all of the stuff that you accumulate in the other parts of the cache. That's why you get this. Okay, maybe if I, if I analyze it. And then when your working set changes, you adapt to the working set, basically, because you randomly start inserting into the MRU. You don't keep your working set constant. If you do LIP, the downside with this low priority insertion policy is, uh, so the way it works is, initially all blocks are invalid. What happens is, you basically populate all of the invalid blocks with the first eight elements over here. A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, whatever, uh, basically first K elements. And then once the cache is populated, you only insert into the lowest priority position 
So a k minus 1 always remains in the cache. As a result, you get k minus 1 divided by t over here. But once your access pattern changes, you cannot adapt, right? Because your cache was already populated with uh, k minus 1 blocks from this. And it's not going to change if, you, if your policy doesn't adapt. Uh, with with bi bimodal insertion policy, you're adapting to the working set change while limiting the thrashing that happens because you have a huge working set, as you see over here. OK, so that's the idea. That's how you can get close to the optimal, optimal analysis you can do by yourself. Uh, and this is actually the more detailed analysis in the paper. It's not exactly. Uh, that's why we have, we have this almost equal to. But if you do the detailed analysis, you will see that uh, that's the case. OK, so what does this buy you? Basically, it buys your performance. Uh, if you look at uh, um, this low priority insertion policy, it's good for some workloads, but it's not good for some workloads. Because you don't, uh, you don't want to always insert at low priority. LRU actually is useful in some cases, as you see. Uh, bimodal insertion policy uh, actually buys you this. It's actually not good by itself, as you can see, because bimodal also uh, loses performance. So how do you actually uh, do better? Basically, you do the same thing that we've discussed. You, LRU is very strong, actually. There are applications that are very, very LRU friendly. As a result, they're losing performance, even with the bimodal insertion policy over here. So you want to essentially uh, have a more dynamic mechanism that chooses between LRU and bimodal insertion policy. And we've already discussed this. You use set sampling to figure out uh, whether you use LRU or BIP. And the new policy is called dynamic insertion policy that picks between uh, LRU and uh, bimodal insertion policy. And that gets you the best of both worlds, if you will. It gets you higher performance. Now, this is a reduction in MPKI. Maybe performance is somewhere over here, which is here. Now, the, and these are different policies, as you can see, different combinations of the policies, LRU plus random, LRU plus least fre fre frequently used, LRU plus MRU, and you can read the paper for more detail. And uh, this dynamic insertion policy gets you a better performance that's closer to the optimal policy and performance that's close to a larger cache. Okay. So basically, here we're trying to adapt the uh, policy to the access patterns. You have two common access patterns. Streaming and thrashing. And you would like to accommodate uh, both. Uh, and also, of course, LRU. And that's how you uh, accommodate both. And also working set changes. So this is uh, a more efficiently utilized cache. Uh, OK, let's see if I want to cover this one. Any questions? OK, maybe I'll briefly cover this one, uh, because this is also one of the latest works. Well, not latest works, but one of the uh, insightful latest works, let's say, uh, that looks at cache utilization. And we already covered a lot of this. Basically, effective cache utilization is even more important cache uh, uh, multi-core. And uh, this work looks at reuse behavior of different cache blocks. Different blocks have different reuse behavior. If you have this access sequence, for example, you may have high reuse blocks, and you may have low reuse blocks. How do you identify them? Ideal cache just keeps the high reuse blocks, as we've discussed, right? The problem is low reuse blocks evict high reuse blocks, uh, with the LRU policy especially. And this is what we've seen earlier. Now I'm giving you the pictorial view of it. So we would like to predict the reuse behavior of the missing blocks and insert low reuse blocks at the LRU position. This is what you would like to do, basically. So this is the uh, low priority insertion policy. Whenever you, for example, miss uh, uh, you, you basically uh, insert things in the LRU position based on your prediction. Uh, if, you, if your prediction says uh, uh, things are low reuse, you insert at the LRU, low priority position. If, if things are high reuse, you insert them at the MRU position. So now you have a reuse predictor uh, determining where you should insert. Uh, there's another problem, which is high reuse blocks can evict each other also. This is the example that we've seen earlier. This is the thrashing problem. You may have a working set that's larger than your cache, even though you keep iterating over your working set many, many times, which means that you have high reuse, you don't have enough cache space. In this case, yeah, this is what happens basically. You keep evicting. Uh, you, you actually use the bimodal insertion policy that we discussed. Insert at MRU position with a very low probability. This actually limits the thrashing that you have in your cache. So bimodal insertion policy is very good for thrashing. With some probability, you insert at uh, the MRU position. A fraction of the working set always stays in the cache because of that. Uh, these don't change a lot. These change a lot. Uh, 
but you limit the damage to the LRU position and you protect some part of your working set from the streaming or thrashing behavior. Okay, so how do you handle both was one of the questions that this paper asks. You need to address both pollution and thrashing concurrently. Cache pollution, again, rem remember that this is higher use blocks being evicted by lower use blocks. You need to distinguish between them somehow. And cache thrashing, you need to control the number of blocks inserted with high priority into the cache. Uh, so reuse prediction, how do you do that? They're actually, this is actually very general. Uh, you have a cache miss, you have the block address, you're bringing the block into the cache, you basically need to predict whether it's going to be higher use or low reuse. Uh, we, we want to keep track of the reuse behavior of every cache block in the system, but this is actually impractical. Every cache block, that's a lot of metadata. Because you don't want to look at just the stuff in your cache, right? Actually, what's really more important is stuff outside your cache that's not in the cache. That's somewhere in memory. And that's a lot of blocks. And you don't want to store metadata associated with a lot of blocks. It's high storage overhead and low lookup, uh, high lookup latency. So peop, uh, these are some uh, past approaches to reuse prediction uh, in hardware, but you could think of software approaches also. So uh, people use uh, program counter or memory region information. Program counter means this load always brings in high reuse blocks into the cache. That's actually the Tyson paper from 1995 that I discussed. Uh, or memory region. The blocks that are within this memory region are high reuse. So you could, the, the, this is a property of the instruction uh, in this case, the assumption is that reuse is a property of the instruction. In this case, the assumption is that the reuse is a property of data. It's not always that clear cut, and it's not always constant. Sometimes instructions change behavior also. Sometimes data changes behavior also. But both types of prediction exist, and both are somewhat accurate. So if you want to use the program counter, you group the blocks uh, based on program counter, and they learn the group behavior. So this pre program counter, this load instruction brings blocks A, B, this load instruction blo brings blocks ST, and it turns out some of them are higher use, some of them are lower use. If it's clear cut like this, that's nice. You can build a predictor like this. But uh, it's not always true that the same group has the same reuse behavior, it turns out. Sometimes loads are actually, same load may bring different types of reuse behavior blocks, and there's no control over the no low, uh, number of high reuse blocks in this case. This doesn't solve the thrashing problem, basically. So per block reuse prediction, uh, the idea in this work is to use the recency of eviction to predict reuse in a simple way. So let's take a look at this. Basically, you have, uh, you're evicting a block from the cache. You already fetched it into the cache. You're evicting it. This block may be needed soon after the eviction. You basically miss on the block very soon after you evict it. Maybe this is an indicator of, oh, you shouldn't have evicted it in the first place. Right? So that's the idea over here. You evicted the block. You did the wrong thing. You learned from it. So maybe you mark it as high reuse because it's accessed soon after the eviction. You did the wrong thing by evicting it. Another block over here, it's the time of eviction. It's accessed very long time after eviction. Then you classify it as low reuse because you didn't really need it. So you did the right thing by evicting it. Basically, you learn by evicting blocks. That's the idea. That's why this is called evicted address filter. Uh, and we're going to see the implementation of it. So there's a threshold somehow that basically identifies uh, high reuse blocks as blocks that are evicted soon after, uh, the, that are reused soon after they're evicted, and low reuse blocks as blocks that are reused, that are needed, requested, uh, long after they're evicted. Now let's take a look at how this uh, can be built, this reuse predictor can be built. You have this cache, and you have addresses of recently evicted blocks that you store, and whenever you evict a block, you basically append it to this evicted address filter. So you have the miss block address. Whenever you get a miss in the cache, you basically consult this evicted address filter. Evicted address filter says, uh, basically you ask the question, is this address in the filter? Is it part of the set of recently evicted blocks? And if the answer is yes, then you insert the block as high reuse into the cache uh, to the MRU position. If it's not in the evicted address filter, then you insert the block as low reuse into the cache uh, such that it doesn't impact other blocks. That's the idea. It's very simple. Of course, there are other design choices that you do that you can do. For example, uh, there's always a question, should you even insert this block into the cache? You could actually not insert it. It turns out if you, uh, not inserting may be good, but the opportunity cost is also bad. Uh, because if you don't insert, and if it's really needed, uh, if you made a misprediction, basically, 
you need to go to uh, memory again. Okay. Okay, so now the question is how do you actually build this evicted address filter? Uh, essentially, it's a set of addresses that are recently evicted. And this should remind you of some structures that we've seen before, like Bloom filters. <laughs> so you can actually store the addresses, but it's very cumbersome, right? Full address tags give you a large storage overhead, I don't know, maybe 32 bits per address. That's not good. You get associative lookups also, maybe worse than the large storage overhead. Now you need to search for this address in this evicted address filter. You get high energy. So the key realization is that this is a predictor. This is not a correct, uh, this, this structure doesn't require correctness. Uh, well, it doesn't affect correctness, basically. What it does doesn't affect correctness. It's just a predictor. So it doesn't need to be 100% accurate. So why don't we replace this evicted address filter with something that we know of before? It's a Bloom filter, basically. And some of the properties of the Bloom filter fit this really well. Uh, basically, uh, you get low storage and overhead and energy. It's a big vector, and we know Bloom filters by now. And this is the paper that I haven't assigned, but I, we've discussed this uh, a lot before. So I'm not going to go through this in detail. Uh, but there's a lot of work on Bloom filters, and you've seen it in the case of Raider before. OK, so just to overview, it's a bit vector. You have a set of hash functions. If you want to insert an address, you go through the hash functions and the set the bits that uh, the hash functions map this address to. And then you set insert y, and then I don't know what's happening. You test. OK, you test x exists. Basically, you go through the hash functions again. You test if z exists. You go through the hash function again. It doesn't exist. Uh, and then you test if w exists. You didn't insert it, but you get a false positive in this case, right? You know this very well. I like this animation because I think this clearly clarifies it better. I should use it early on, actually. Uh, whenever I introduce the uh, uh, Bloom filters. OK, so you get a false positive. Clearly, you need to. Uh, one of the issues is remove x. If you want to remove x, this operation is not really nice in a Bloom filter. You could do it. You could go through the hash function and remove x, but it removes multiple addresses. Right? Because it, sets, it, removes some, it zeroes some bits that are set by other insertion of other addresses. So remove is not clean in a Bloom filter. You cannot remove just that element. Yes, you remove that element, but you remove other elements also. So this is something that's not going to be a good fit for this application, so we're going to clear the balloon filter. But you can clear the balloon filter, basically, set it all to zeros. But removing a single element is not uh, possible perfectly. Approximately, it's possible, but you don't know what else you're removing. OK, so evicted address filter using a balloon filter, you insert the evicted block address coming from the cache. Whenever you uh, have a cache miss, you test whether that block exists in the evict address filter, and you remove it if present, ideally, because if it's present, you're going to insert it into the cache. It's not evicted anymore, ideally. And you remove a block uh, when the, ad uh, the last address, uh, uh, the oldest address that you inserted when this is full, basically. So ideally, you would like these operations. Bloom filter doesn't give you all of these operations. So you can get insert and test very quickly. You cannot get element-wise remove. As a result, we're going to get rid of this remove. It's not perfect, as I said. It's not a perfect application of Bloom filter, but it works on average. And as opposed to removing, when, when the Bloom filter becomes full, as opposed to removing an element, we clear the Bloom filter. And the paper actually discusses multiple Bloom filter implementations of it. You can re look at the detail. You can actually be, if you clear the Bloom filter, it's really, you get rid of everything in the address filter, right? That may not be a good thing to do. It's a very quick uh, drop. So if you actually have two Bloom filters, maintain two of them, you can be more graceful in how you handle the address in your evict address filter. So usually, if you clear something, you're not very graceful. <laughs> you get rid of every element in here. OK, so basically, uh, you get 4x reduction in uh, storage overhead compared to having full address tags. And it's actually, yeah, you can read the paper. So the final design looks like this. Basically, you have a cache. Outside the cache, you have a Bloom filter and a counter. When you evict something from the cache, you insert the address into the filter, like set some bits. You increment the counter, number of stuff that you have in the Bloom filter, number of addresses. When you get a cache miss, you test if the address is present in the filter. If it is present, you insert at the MRU position, predicting that it's high reuse. You did the wrong thing by evicting it recently. Otherwise, you insert it with the bimodal insertion policy that we discussed. And bimodal insertion policy as you know, is probabilistic. 
with some low probability inserts at the MRU position, with some very high probability it's inserts at the LRU position. So it's, you, you actually have another chance to insert multi MRU position over here with the bimodal insertion policy. And when the counter reaches the max, which means that your bloom filter has a lot of addresses, you clear the filter and the counter, and you keep repeating. But of course, there are graceful methods to do that, as we've discussed. So the advantages of this is, it's a simple to implement. Uh, it's easy to design and verify because it's separate from the cache. It doesn't change the cache structure, which is always a good thing. If you attended Arvin's lecture, it was all about modular design, right? Modular hardware design. It's actually a good modular hardware design. You don't change one structure, you augment it. Uh, and works with other techniques also. Basically, you can plug and play different replacement policies into it. Basically, you have this nice, clean interface, if you will, which was Arvin's lecture, what Arvin's lecture was all about, interfaces, clean interfaces and uh, decoupling things. You have this nice, clean interface in this case. So it's actually relatively easy to implement. So let's see how it performs. Uh, okay, uh, you don't know all of these policies, but you can read the paper for more detail. Uh, TADIP, this is the dynamic insertion policy that we've seen earlier. TA means thread-aware version of it. So there's a thread-aware version of it to make sure that uh, different threads don't destroy each other's performance, obviously. Uh, there should be a thread aware version of evicted address filter also, but it doesn't exist in this paper. Uh, basically, uh, it improves performance significantly compared to the best previous policy. And there are other p policies that you can read about. So literature is full of cache replacement and insertion policies. Uh, and you can see that the performance increases are significant as you keep increasing the number of cores. Uh, Okay, some, uh, some, just to give you some other approaches that people have tried, so people have used memory region-based reuse prediction. This is actually a relatively old paper. You divide memory into regions and predict the reuse of those regions. This was one of the comparison points over here. And it works reasonably well, as you can see, but not as good as, uh, so this is basically region-based. Uh, this is another prediction mechanism that basically uses program counter-based reuse prediction, and those are some of the comparison points. And this basically looks at one most recently evicted block uh, for uh, yeah, various reasons. So these, these basically have no control on the number of blocks inserted with high priority. So they all have thrashing uh, problem, which this work uh, gets rid of. Plus, it, uh, in this work, there is a different reuse prediction mechanism, as you can see. So there's also works that address cache thrashing that we discussed based on the bimodal insertion policy in general. They usually use set dueling to determine thrashing applications, but they usually do not handle pollution. So the takeaway is there are a bunch of mechanisms that handle pollution, but not thrashing, and uh, a bunch of mechanisms that handle thrashing, but not fully pollution. And this work actually combines handling of thrashing and pollution together. And this is another example of the performance evaluation. The performance evaluation in this paper are actually really, really well done. Uh, it's uh, from uh, Vivek Seshadri, one of my PhD students. His thesis was on in-memory computation. We've covered ideas like row clone and MBIT, but he did these works just for fun. Uh, uh, but the performance, if you look at the performance evaluations over here, uh, this basically looks at the, a bunch of workloads, 135. And this is a speed up that you would get over LRU with different mechanisms. Intel, uh, actually, a lot of companies do this, but this is called S-curves at Intel. It's S. Whenever you have a performance optimization idea, you draw a curve for all workloads that you have, that you evaluate on. Uh, and then you uh, draw this curve, which is the delta performance improvement that you would get if, with your next greatest idea. And almost invariably, your curve looks like an S. <laughs> That's why it's called an S curve. Now, you can, you can imagine this like an S over here, right? There's the bottom part of the S. That's the body of the S. And that's the top part of the S. Usually, there are some applications that benefit a lot. There are some applications that lose a lot. And there are some applications uh, that yeah, that looks like this, basically. Although this is a nice, this is a nice S curve. It's usually, I've seen many of these S curves in my life. Usually it looks like this. <laughs> That's more like an S. Most applications don't care. But this is actually a good optimization if your S curve doesn't look like an S. Uh, of course, you don't want the tail to be very large over here. So in this case, basically, a lot of applications gain, as you can see. And DEAF is a dynamic version of this yeah, that you can read about in the paper. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, so this is, uh, this is EAF. Uh, we're going to talk about the EAF very quickly. Uh, basically, this is the evicted address filter. Uh, this is SHIP, the previous best mechanism. It looks like this. 
Unfortunately, you have this problem over here in both. And it turns out there are some applications that are very, very friendly to LRU. So LRU is very strong, as I mentioned earlier. You really want to employ LRU policy for those applications. And if you actually do set sampling, you can get rid of those applications that lose, mostly, and without losing much performance over here. So DAF is a version of evicted address filter that selects between evicted address filter and LRU. That's the idea. If the application is really doing well with LRU, that's good. The, the issue uh, is uh, if you are very LRU friendly, you would really like to start inserting into the MRU position right away. Right? But evicted address filter doesn't do that. Right? What it does is it needs to see an address to be evicted before it starts inserting into the MRU position. And it's too late for many applications. They lose a lot of performance because it's too late. And hopefully this gives you an idea of the complexity of the reuse prediction. It's a lot of heuristics here, but heuristics that work. OK. So effect of cache size, and you can do studies like this. And as expected, as your cache size increases, uh, uh, the speed up, weighted speed up improvement uh, reduces. Uh, but you still get benefit at large cache sizes. OK. And you could also do studies like, what, is, what should be the size of your evicted address filter? It's actually really interesting. Uh, this is looking at the size of your evicted address filter in terms of the fraction of number of addresses in the evicted address filter divided by the number of cache blocks that you can store in your cache. One means you have equal number of addresses in the evicted address filter as the number of cache blocks that you store in your cache. It turns out uh, the best area is somewhere over here, the performance improvement maximized. If you have too many blocks that are stored in your evicted address filter, you're basically predicting a lot of blocks to be high reuse, even though you don't have enough cache space for them. If you have too little, then you're predicting too few of the blocks. You have a lot of cache space to accommodate those cache blocks, perhaps, but you're predicting too few blocks to be high reuse. So it's actually an interesting mechanism. Question? Uh, yeah. You measure the reuse by how many times? Yeah. Is that not um, what is called? Um, one block reuse once, uh -huh. and if it's reused once again, then it's the same. So uh, uh, let me see if I understood right. You basically evict this block once. It goes into the evict address filter. Exactly. Yeah. Then it's used again. And if it's used, so if it if it's used again, uh, in the, so if it's used once, uh, so okay, uh, you insert into the. I see. And then it's not used again. Yeah. I see. Then, yeah, the, that's a misprediction, basically. So, yeah, this is not perfect also. So if, if, a, block is, uh, if a block is not used, if, it, if, a, if a block is used only once after it's evicted, this, that is the worst, one of the worst cases for evicted address filter. And there's the, those sort of blocks. And you can handle them in some other way, perhaps. But this paper doesn't handle them. But that's a very good point. So all of these replacement insertion policies have these cases where they, uh, uh, that they cannot handle very well. <laughs> I think in this case, you found the bad case for <laughs> evicted address filter. Basically, you, you think it's going to be reused again. You insert it, but it's not going to be reused. Yeah, or, or too late, yes. That's another possibility. Yeah, but on average, it works. <laughs> Yeah. So there is a need for actually more sophisticated mechanisms, but it's always a trade-off between complexity and sophistication. Uh, but there's still more work to be done in this area for sure. OK, so I'm going to skip this because we've already discussed this. And there are a bunch of other results in the paper if you're interested in that, like decouple, uh, segment the DAF to make think transitions more uh, graceful. And this also improves fairness, and that's also in the paper. OK, any questions? Let's see. So I'm not sure if I want to cover this one. But basically, uh, now that we know about caching, uh, it's good to revisit uh, these strong memory service guarantees. And I think I'll cover, the, uh, cover it very quickly. Remember the idea of MICE? Uh, we provided uh, a slowdown estimation mechanism for main memory. But this didn't take into account caches. Now that you understand the complexity of caching, 
hopefully you'll appreciate the fact that slowdown estimation, the presence of caching is even worse than slowdown estimation in memory. Uh, and that was, that's the next work that I'm going to talk about. How do we extend the MICE model to include shared cache interference? You have shared caches, and how do you actually uh, estimate the uh, inter uh, uh, slowdown of an application when you have shared caches and shared main memory? And that was uh, the extension of MICE work uh, to uh, uh, shared main memory. It's called the application slowdown model. It's Lamaya's work, uh, which you've seen before. OK, so I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. Uh, basically, remember, mice estimate a slowdown with the request service rate alone divided by request service rate shared, which is a good abstraction over here. How do you do it at this level? Because you don't have just main memory as a shared resource. You have shared cache capacity also. So essentially, cache capacity is a little bit different from main memory. That's the key here, as you've seen. It's stateful, whereas there is little state here. Robofer is a state, yes, but it's not as big as this one. Uh, so you have a cache access rate, uh, and you may prioritize this applet core over here. It's data returns over here. And then later, this particular application uh, gets this data to be returned and contends with this one. Basic applications are weak to each other's blocks from the shared cache. So we want to estimate cache and memory slowdowns. We have memory service rate over here. Basically, the key concept applies over here. Uh, if you want to estimate the slowdown of a memory bound application or any application, just look at the cache service rate over here. And you can express, uh, well, uh, or access rates actually. We're going to look at the cache access rate in this case, but you can read the paper for the details. Because service rates and access rates are tightly coupled, essentially, you can, uh, how much service you're getting uh, is dependent on how, much, how many accesses you're putting in also. So the application slowdown model basically does this. It expresses slowdown as cache access rate of the application when it's running alone, divided by cache access rate when it's running together with other applications. Then the question becomes, how do you estimate both? Right? Cache access rate shared is easy. You basically figure out uh, how many accesses do you're doing in a given interval uh, by observing the number of accesses over here. And again, this is data from real uh, workloads. This is an Intel system, I believe. If you look at the cache access rate ratio, uh, of uh, applications, it correlates nicely with slowdown. It's almost a linear uh, number over here. Basically, how, how much you're increasing your cache access rate, uh, or decreasing your cache access rate in this case, uh, is correlated with how, how much you're slowing down the program. OK, then the key question is, how do you estimate the alone cache access rate, as you can imagine? So if you want to do that, you want to give priority to the application when it's running in main memory, and you need to use an auxiliary tax store. There's no other way that I know of at this point to estimate an application's slowdown without use, uh, using an auxiliary tax store that keeps track of or estimates what would be the contents of the cache if this application were running alone. And that's the idea over here. You have two auxiliary cache stores for these two different cores, and then you basically give priority to the application who's at cache access rate you're trying to estimate in main memory. And you basically store the data in the auxiliary tax store to keep track of what blocks it would have in the cache if it were running alone. And that's true for the other applications also. OK, basically auxiliary tax store tracks contention misses that happen in the shared cache because they're not affected by the contention that's occurring in the shared cache. That's the idea. And I'm not going to go through this in detail. Uh, basically, you need to do similar things as we've discussed. Uh, to actually measure the slowdown. But it's not, an, it's not a very complicated model. The complication is really in the design over here. You get a bunch of contention. Basically, you need to figure out uh, what is the number of contention misses that you're getting additionally because somebody else kicked your data out from the cache. And you can figure that out. Whenever you access the cache, you get a miss, but your auxiliary tax store says, oh, you should have a hit. That means that you got the cache miss because Somebody else interfered with you, right? That's the idea. You keep track of those misses, and you keep track of how much impact those misses have on your service time. So this, you can think of this as a performance model. And performance model basically predicts what is your average memory service time of a miss when the application is given priority, as if it were running alone. That's the other insight over here. You can keep track of the contention misses. You can keep track of approximate number of cycles uh, that each miss takes by giving higher priority to this application in the memory controller and by counting the average memory service time. And 
Once you have this information, cash contention cycles is the additional number of cycles that you have because you have some number of contention misses and each miss costs some number of cycles. So that's cash contention cycles. And you basically uh, estimate the cash access rate similar to what we've done before. You have a number of requests during high priority epochs, high priority inverted intervals where this application is given high priority. And the number of cycles the application is given high priority and you subtract from it the contention cycles that the application additionally has. And that, that allows you to estimate the cash access rate alone. So hopefully this is clear. It's very, I mean, once you know the MICE model, it's a relatively simple concept. The difficulty is really how to estimate the extra cycles you have because of cash contention. And that makes it complicated because you need to keep track of what would have been in your cash if you were running alone. Uh, and that's the idea over here. Okay, so we already know some of the works in slowdown estimation. Uh, and we already know the differences. Basically, a lot of these works count interference experienced by each request is different, but the estimates that we have, very similar to mice, are more coarse-grained. It's easier to estimate. And if you look at the model accuracy, uh, the average slowdown estimate is about 10%, which is not bad. Uh, if you remember mice, it was about 8.8% across many applications. In this case, it's about also 10%. Uh, but I think there's more to do in this area. And the paper looks at different ways of managing this. Uh, if you, basically, you can do a slowdown of a resource allocation, just sim similar to what we've discussed earlier. You can have slowdown of a resource allocation to bound the application slowdowns and virtual machine migration and admission control schemes like we've discussed before, and maybe even fair billing schemes in a commodity cloud. Depending on how much slowdown you're causing to people, you get uh, billed. Uh, or you get billed based on how much performance you're getting out of the cloud. Uh, Again, I'm going to skip all of these because this is something that we've uh, discussed earlier. So, okay, maybe I'll talk about this one <laughs> very quickly before we take a break. But basically, uh, because we didn't talk, uh, you can actually use these slowdown estimations to do cache capacity partitioning. Uh, that's something we didn't talk about. Your cache capacity partitioning may be more methodical this way. You have a shared cache. Many previous works, as we've discussed, don't, do, don't use slowdowns to do the capacity partitioning. Uh, but one way is deciding how many ways do you allocate to different cores. Previous partitioning mechanisms usually optimize for miscount, as we've seen. They're not aware of performance and slowdowns in general. So we want to do a slowdown estimation. You use a ASM to estimate slowdown for all possible cache way allocations. So that's one downside over here. Whenever you want to decide how many ways to allocate uh, to a cache, you need to potentially estimate the slowdowns that you would get if you actually allocate this many ways to a particular application. And this is easy to do. It's not that hard because uh, uh, what you do is you already have an auxiliary tax store. And in the auxiliary tax store, you keep track of how many contention misses you would get if you allocate only one way, two way, three way, four way, five way, dot, 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 for that particular application. So you can actually scale this up relatively easily. Of course, the model error changes. Uh, but it's not that hard to do once you have an auxiliary tax store. You estimate the slowdown for possible cache way, cache way allocations for each application and allocate each way to the application whose slowdown reduces the most by allocating that way. So it's essentially utility-based uh, way partitioning that's driven by slowdown estimations, where the utility is calculated in terms of the slowdown that you get. Okay, and then you can do memory bandwidth partitioning similar to what MICE does. I'm not going to go through this in detail. But you can see. And now the key question is you need to combine both of them, basically. You, you can do cache capacity aware bandwidth allocation. You employ uh, the cache partitioning mechanism that I described to partition cache capacity and drive the memory bandwidth partitioning with slowdowns from ASM, uh, from estimated from this cache partitioning mechanism. And if you're interested, you can read the paper. But this is the benefit you get. Uh, essentially, uh, this is the fairness and performance results. If you do slowdown aware cache partitioning, it outperforms previous mechanisms uh, that are not slowed on aware. And there's utility-based cache partitioning uh, in these works also. And you can see that utility-based cache partitioning actually works uh, if you add it to the system. And PARBS, parallelism or batch scheduling, you already know that also works, as you, as you can see. OK, so we already discussed this. Uh, and you can actually uh, download the source code and do experiments if you're interested. So this is the state of the art in terms of slowdown, es slowdown estimation uh, uh, in, I don't want to call it the entire system, but it's really caches and memory together. 
Of course, if you want to do it in the entire system, there is more to do in this area. And that brings me to the end of the cache management lecture. Any questions? Thoughts? Okay, this is, good. this is a good place to take a break, I think. <laughs> so let's take a 10-minute break. Uh, let's be back at tw 25 past.